Welcome and happy Monday to everyone. I think we're on day 15 of the ASF Virtual Blues. I don't know, but I know we're moving into our third week. And I know that I am super excited about tonight's presentation. You guys have been asking for this. Everyone keeps asking, when is this presentation? So I know that tonight is going to be a great night and I see people joining like crazy right now. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and sticking with us on this long ASF Virtual Palooza. We're heading into our last week, but we have some great stuff still for you this week, so we hope you'll keep joining. And for those of you that this may be your very first ASF Virtual Palooza event, exciting news, because you're here with us tonight, in a couple weeks, you're going to receive an awesome ASF Virtual Palooza t-shirt with the lineup of all the speakers below, because this is an epic event that we've had, and we want to thank you for being a part of it, so you will receive that soon. Also, make sure to sign up for the, for the ASF Virtual Walk. You're going to have a huge rally on September 5th, and we want to make sure that you're there, so if you haven't signed up, please do so. I'm going to stop talking because we have tons of stuff to get to tonight, and I want to introduce my dear friend, Dr. Chris Geary. We're so excited he's here tonight. He has been working with the Angelman um, Syndrome population for a while now in partnership with the AS Clinic at MGH. He is uh, he works in multiple places in Boston. And he specializes in ch child and adolescent psychiatry and neurology, so we are in for a treat tonight. So please welcome my dear friend, Dr. Chris Geary. Great. Uh, Amanda, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction and uh, for the invitation to be here tonight to talk with you all. And I know this is a time if your family is anything like mine, maybe trying to get dinner on the table and things like that. So thank you so much for your, your interest and, uh, and logging in to, to join us tonight. Uh, to talk about a subject that's really near and dear to my heart. I'm a child adolescent and, and adult psychiatrist. I'm the behavioral director at the Angelman Syndrome a Clinic at Mass General Hospital. Where I work with Ron Siebert and seeing kids, teens, and adults with Angelman Syndrome for, for behavioral evaluations, psychiatric evaluations, and treatment plans, and ongoing care. And this topic over the past five or six months has just been uh, all of our lives. It's uh, We're going to talk today about behavioral and anxiety concerns, challenges in, in kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome, specific to things that we've seen in the COVID-19 era. Um, here's my outline for the talk today. I'm going to, I really like presenting from cases. I have cases stick in my mind. I, they're how we learn best or how I learn best. And I'm going to review three different cases that are a little representative of what the families I work with with a loved one with Angelman syndrome have been some of their main concerns from a, from a behavioral standpoint specifically. And we're going to use those cases as a jumping off point to talk about some common behavioral concerns in kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome and review some of the research as to how we know those are concerns, the research that suggests that they're concerns. And we're going to talk a little bit about treatment approach and then come back to those three cases and what were the things that were helpful for those families. I like to say I came up with all those ideas. I didn't. Many of the families came up with those ideas themselves or they worked with their team to come up with some of those ideas and, and um, I contributed where I could. And But I think sharing my experience of what was helpful for those families, I hope that will be helpful for you tonight. And if I don't talk too much, we'll have uh, time for questions, so we better get to it. Um, these are the sources of research funding and some consultation work that I've done over the past five years. We're not going to talk about any treatments today, medications or otherwise that have any connection any of these disclosures. And I should also say that I'm not promoting or selling anything to you tonight. I'm going to talk about medications used for behavioral reasons. These are off-label. There haven't been the number of studies that we want there to be um, looking at some of these medications in kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome. So that's hence the term off-label. But even off-label can still be helpful. So our new normal. Um, it has been enormously difficult for so many of the families that I work with with a loved one with Angelman syndrome. Uh, some of the challenges around trying to keep a six foot distance in a person with Angelman syndrome who may be very loving and affectionate and used to that level of um, physical contact with the people they care about in their lives, um, having to tolerate wearing a mask or understanding why that's important trying to somehow cram the 
complicated and nuanced nature of education for kids, teens, and, and adults with Angelman syndrome and to deliver that over a computer in an online session. These are just some of the extraordinary challenges that you all um, have had to deal with uh, over the past couple months. And uh, it's been enormously difficult. It's come along with some, I think, there are some families that have talked about the pleasures of being able to spend more time with your family. So I think there have been, there are ways in which there can be joys in this as well. But the take home, bottom line from my experience is that it's been revealed. It's been a real challenge for families. Let's talk about one of those families. So John, I should say the cases I'm talking about are kind of amalgams of, of different cases. I'm not speaking about any one person individually and the names I've, I've come up with the names. So I'm not talking about any uh, individual breaking any confidentiality for any of the patients I've worked with. John's 19. He's a 19 year old man with Angelman syndrome, a young, young adult. He has, the parent's main concern was that John has been having these increased episodes of upset and agitation that have been happening um, in the context, a lot of different contexts, limit setting, but primarily with separating from a parent. These have always been challenges for John his whole life, but the level of upset that John is now having with separation is, is way above and beyond what John used to have, have over the past couple months uh, in the COVID situation. He uh, is starting to be aggressive when he's upset, um, and upset is the parents can't have loved ones over to the house because John is so so much wants to be just have having the parents' attention at all times. And while John normally would be attending a vocational sort of transitional program as a young adult, now he's home all the time with the COVID situation, and so. He's really used to being around parents all the time and having their attention constantly. He's also used to having some unfettered access to the kitchen, which is resulting in a lot more food seeking behavior and John's gaining some weight related to this. And when limits are set around food, John is getting really upset. And he's requesting school on a regular basis. In the mornings, John's trying to get his backpack and, and, and things to, with the expectation, seeming expectation of wanting to go to school. He may get upset when they drive by the school, you know, indicating a clear desire to kind of want to go there. So these are the, the concerns the parents are, are coming with. Joe. Let's take a moment to step back and talk about episodes of agitation and aggressive behaviors in kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome. Uh, we know from, there was this trial that was done in 2011, um, Aaron is the author from Chris Oliver's group that looked at kids, you know, looked at populations with Angelman syndrome compared to other uh, um, patients with different genetic syndrome that cause developmental delay and developmental disability. And found, you know, so comparing things like Crater Willie or Smith McGinnis syndrome, other genetic conditions that cause uh, developmental disorder, and found that individuals with Angelman syndrome were among the higher groups in terms of frequency and prevalence of aggressive behaviors. And then one of the first really comprehensive studies of behavioral concern in uh, individuals with Angelman syndrome was done by Logan Wink's group. And they found really high scores on this measure called the ABC. The ABC is a standardized measure for behavioral concern in people with developmental disability. And very high scores on this measure of irritability, which kind of measures aggression. So these original studies kind of describing that as a problem. And then last year, we had a really important trial, uh, well, a very important uh, publication that came out on the natural history study. I hope you all are aware of the natural history study. It's a really important trial, um, multi-site trial that's being done all over um, uh, the United States, maybe beyond actually um, at this point. And uh, this study was just looking at behavioral concern in kids, teens, and adults with angel syndrome. The natural history study is so important because they're following individuals with Angelman syndrome over a prolonged period. And in this case, they described 301 participants with Angelman syndrome. I want to call your attention to this table here. So in this table, if you look at the first column, which is head, the heading for that is behavior, and you look down, you get to aggressive behaviors. And um, each column next to that, you see deletion, you see a column UPD, imprinting disorder, that's what their uniparental disomy is what that stands for in printing disorder, UVE3A mutations. Those are all different 
molecular mechanisms of inheritance that England has been working on. And look at the, the prevalence rates of aggressive behavior. So the highest rate was in individuals with a uniparental disomy and printing defect um, mechanism of inheritance, 84%. And a little lower for people with a UBE3A mutation, and then 50%, still substantial, for individuals with a deletion uh, mechanism of inheritance. What's not shown in this uh, table that I put here is that when they followed individuals over time, they found higher rates of aggression as they got older, moving into sort of the teenage years and adult years. And that that rate of increase with age was most significant for individuals with the UPD imprinting defect category. And then still an increase, but not a substantial for individuals with UBE3A mutation. And excuse me, still an increase, but not a substantial for individuals with deletion. So it seems like there may be some connection here between the mechanism of inheritance. Um, but before we talk more about aggression prevalence, we should talk about there's a lot more to aggression than what we might think in individuals with Angelman syndrome. Um, sometimes we may imagine that aggression is all driven by anger and frustration. And that's just not been my experience working with kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome, where aggression might have a variety of different we might say purposes behind it or emotions behind it, and upset or frustration or anger is really only just one of them. I've listed a couple here, so anger at the top. Um, but over here on the side, I've written sort of look at me. So aggression, it, for many patients I work with with Angelman syndrome, can have a attention-seeking quality to it. This is usually not hard to puzzle out. There um, is a the, a parent's attention might be divided like in a doctor's appointment, for instance, and an aggressive behavior seeks to pull the, the parent's attention to, to the child or adult with angel syndrome and, uh, and maintain that close connection. Um, and then I have written here sort of communication as well over on your left. So there are a lot of families I've worked with with a loved one of Angelman syndrome that say aggression is one of my few windows into knowing what their um, what their likes and dislikes, maybe what they what they really want when they really need something, when they may be, you know, in discomfort of some kind. And so while we always want to focus and education on developing other communication strategies, aggression can sometimes have a communicative intent to convey something important to that individual with Angelman syndrome. And then down here at the bottom I've written pain. So particularly in situations where we don't see a clear precipitant for that aggressive behavior, it's not attention seeking, it's not really to get a preferred thing or even frustration with a non-preferred demand. I try to make sure I think about, okay, could this be an underlying medical condition that we're missing of some kind? And here are some things I try to tick off in my mind if I'm seeing a lot of aggressive behaviors without clear uh, precipitants behind them. Um, I've written here constipation, dysmenorrhea, gastroesophageal reflux, so that's, you know, heartburn. Um, you know, severe reflux, dental problems, scoliosis, and then post confusion. So, of course, epilepsy, more common in Angelman syndrome, and post refers to that period right after a seizure. So, post you know, extreme sedation or confusion can result in, in an, agitated, uh, an ap agitated episode, agitated period. Um, you know, dysmenorrhea for a lot of um, young women I work with with Angelman syndrome or um, sort of pubertal girls, parents may describe a period of like three to five days prior to the onset of menses where there is much more of a challenge with aggressive behaviors. And I try to think, okay, could that individual be having, you know, pain? Um, you know, is it worth trying a trial of something like ibuprofen? Or could it be just hormonal changes that are associated with the onset of menses, which have profound connections to things like mood. Um, and in some patients, it's been so severe that the family have sought out consultation with a gynecologist to think about using birth control. And they might set it up in a system where an individual takes birth control and then has their um, menses like two, three, or four times a year, um, and that that's made a big difference in terms of decreasing aggressive behaviors. Besides dysmenorrhea, all the other items on this list are more common in individuals with Angelman syndrome than other individuals with developmental disability. So this trial I've listed here, Larson et al. 2015, looked at teens and adults with Angelman syndrome and found that 
uh, you know, very high levels of constipation, 85% in the trial, scoliosis, 50%. I have had two adults with Angelman syndrome who had you know, uh, an intervention to correct their scoliosis and had a substantial decrease in their aggression subsequent to that, you know, leading us to think that it could have been pain that's driving it. So it's, these are important things to not miss in kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome. Uh, and to help us not miss things like that or to try and understand what might drive aggressive behaviors, um, a very useful tool can be a functional behavioral assessment. A functional behavioral assessment is a, is a tool in the tool belt of the behavioral therapist um, and is a common, um, a common tool that's used in um, applied behavioral analysis or ABA. So the idea behind the FBA is pretty simple. It's about looking at a specific behavior, counting how often it happens, and the evaluator will write down what the antecedent to the behavior was, what were the, the things that were happening right before the behavior, and what was the consequence. How did the individual with Angelman's family or school or surrounding respond to his or her behavior? And that can really provide a very unique window into what drives and maintains that aggressive behavior. And that's a really key part of understanding a treatment plan. I really don't think that every situation of aggressive behavior warrants the medication. There can be a lot of smart interventions that can be done to the environment that can make a big difference. So I find an FBA extremely useful um, tool to try and develop a treatment plan for when aggressive behaviors are the parents' main thing. Another possibility of what could be driving it is anxiety. There's some evidence suggesting that anxiety may be a problem for kids, teens, and adults with angel syndrome. Anxiety was first mentioned in a trial in 2001 by Dr. Clayton Smith, a really important geneticist in the world of angel syndrome, who uh, identified in a number of her, the patients in this case series that she did, a very carefully described case series where families really fought their loved one with Angelman syndrome was suffering with anxiety. I mentioned that trial from 2015 done by Larson et al. looking at teens and adults and found that 46% of caregivers thought their loved one with Angelman syndrome showed signs of anxiety. And a follow-up on that trial done in 2018 showed that those concerns seemed to increase moving into late teenage years and adulthood, those concerns around anxiety on the part of caregivers. We had, funded by the Angelman syndrome foundation, um, work that we did looking at how families describe uh, behaviors they think that are concerning for anxiety. And the number one behavior that's described by families that they think is concerning for anxiety is aggression. So families seem to really worry that there's a connection there with anxiety. I want to tell you about an important trial that was uh, published last year by Ann Wheeler's group. Ann Wheeler used her, her, her groups clinical experience working with a lot of kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome to modify a tool that measured anxiety in individuals with developmental disability and to try and make it more specific for people with Angelman syndrome. So they added a lot more questions around, does your loved one have problems with separation from a parent or a loved one? And a, a lot of other sort of questions for how anxiety can present. You might have a hard time seeing on your screen because the lettering is really small here. And I apologize for that, but here are the results. So they, uh, Dr. Wheeler's group sent this assessment tool to 100 um, uh, families uh, with a loved one with Angelman syndrome and asked them to rate whether certain things were an issue or not. And there were very high rates of report of distress with separation, um, up to 80% in of teenagers who responded. Um, other common uh, behaviors that were reported that sound kind of concerning for anxiety, excessive clinginess, not being able to relax, nervous habits, excessive trembling. Just a comment on that issue of excessive trembling. This can be part of Angelman syndrome. Angelman syndrome can itself bring a tremor or myoclonus as part of the neurologic manifestations of, of Angelman syndrome. But a lot of families will describe tremulousness that seems to occur in response to what very specific scenarios like crowds or an individual 
that is not well known to the person with Angelman syndrome coming into their personal space um, and you know coming up on them with you know big uh, emotions and contact when they don't know that person well. Scenarios like this and seeing trembling just in those scenarios that may suggest that trembling is is manifestation of anxiety and it makes me think about the fight or flight response. You know when our body feels panic or anxiety over something, there's a release of epinephrine, more epinephrine or adrenaline, and it can do have profound effects on the body. It can cause things like increased heart rate or breathing faster or sweating or dilated pupils or nausea because the GI system stops digesting and sort of slows way down, which can result in nausea or even vomiting. Um, so these can all be signs when they're not due to another medical condition and you're careful about ruling that out, these can all be things that might make you think more about anxiety or a sort of strong emotional response. Our group published a trial uh, last year um, looking at an anxiety medication called Boosterone. We chose Boosterone because it's really well tolerated and kids, teens and adults with Angelman syndrome tend to be sensitive to medicines. So we wanted to choose a medicine we know is effective for anxiety but well tolerated. And we had um, three different cases of adults with Angelman syndrome who took Boosterone for what we thought might have been behaviors concerning for anxiety. And we saw improvements in self-injury, improvements in aggression, uh, reduced sweating, uh, decreased fear of crowds in some subjects. One subject had a real reduction, excessive swallowing and sort of vomiting and gagging. Um, and it was well tolerated for all three subjects. So this is the first treatment report for um, using a medication for the treatment of anxiety issues for angel syndrome. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what a treatment approach for aggressive or agitative behaviors in kids, teens, and adults with angel syndrome might look like. Um, I'm going to talk about occupational therapy in, in, again in this presentation because I think it's an important uh, part of what could be a treatment plan. Uh, occupational therapy, in addition to teaching functional skills, can also um, focus on trying to identify self-regulation skills. Uh, you might have had your loved ones of Angelman syndrome work with an OT around the zones of regulation. You know, red where there's agitated, worked up, excited, towards green, more calm, chill, ready to work, and strategies that try and bring individuals from the red zone into the green zone, which tend to be sort of sensory calming strategies, uh, can be really helpful. I think about communication as being really uh, sort of almost an insurance plan against aggression and having communicative strategies which don't necessarily need to be spoken speech can really help uh, address the what can be the root of a lot of aggressive behaviors frustration about not being able to convey yourself um, so whether that's usage of modified sign language or whether that's the usage of sort of pictures that represent particular things like a, a PEC system or picture exchange communication PEC system or a, a talker, you know, a, a, a device that um, where you press the icons and it vocalizes the, the, the phrase constructed by the person with Angelman syndrome. Um, I think about speech therapy being focused on these augmentative alternative communication strategies, but the focus is really should not be just on learning new words. Ideally, focuses should also be on strategy, communicative strategies to address what might be some of the triggers for aggressive behaviors, like being able to ask for a break. Um, you can see how that would be an extremely important sort of safety valve if something is frustrating for an individual with Angelman syndrome, you know, to be able to uh, reduce that frustration without using aggression. Um, being able to request preferred items so that aggression doesn't always have to be a communicative intent to get what someone wants. And if individuals with Angelman syndrome can you know, connect with certain pictures or certain icons, preferred activities, that can be the basis for them developing a visual schedule, uh, which can be really helpful with setting expectations for the, for the day and routine, which also can avert aggression in its own way. I've worked with individuals with Angelman syndrome who, uh, where their parents said they didn't really see improvement with communication and strategies until the mid-teens. So I try to get schools not to necessarily give up on those strategies, you know, if they're still struggling at seven, eight, nine, ten, um, it, you know, that it could still be, it could still be something that would be helpful. 
and then behavioral therapy, which I talked a little bit about before when I mentioned the functional behavioral assessment, the FBA. This can help identify precipitants, you know, what's driving that aggressive behavior. They can help track whether you've seen improvement from trying something new, like a new OT intervention or, excuse me, a new communication strategy. And uh, with behavioral therapy, when a new strategy is implemented to try and address an aggressive behavior, it's an important thing that there can sometimes be an increase in that behavior before things get better. So um, I try to warn families of that, that that may be something that may not necessarily mean ADA doesn't work or behavioral therapy doesn't work. Evaluation for medical contributors, which I mentioned. And I just put in here psychological therapy because I've struggled with some of my patients, um, particularly adults, with getting behavioral therapy for them. And I try to advocate as much as I can uh, with insurance companies for that. When I've really struggled and completely struck out, I've tried to find um, therapists who do a cognitive behavioral therapy sort of strategy, if possible, that have worked with kids with developmental disabilities in the past. Because while they don't necessarily do strict ABA behavioral therapy, they could still design um, what's called an exposure hierarchy, exposing an individual with Angelman syndrome if they're having reactions to crowds, for instance doing a little bit of that crowd, little by little by little, with big reinforcement afterwards to try and increase their tolerance for an anxiety-provoking situation. So um, therapy can be something that can be helpful for uh, individuals with Angelman syndrome, even who don't have any expressive speech. And then we'll also talk about medications. I um, try to emphasize those non-medication approaches before I move to medicines, but medications can be helpful. I mentioned Boosteron, which acts um, similar to how serotonin, the neurotransmitter serotonin in the brain acts. And then if I don't have success with boosterone, I think in my mind, okay, is this really severe, substantial, highly dangerous aggression, or is it less severe, but the medicine's still warranted? If less severe, these are the classes of medicines I'm thinking of. I've written here benzodiazepines, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. I'll make these slides available. So I, if any of you are writing furiously, I'm going to make sure these slides are available for you all um, if you want to uh, reference them at a later point. Um, SSRIs and mirtazapine, those are antidepressants, um, which I've seen some improvement with. And then propranolol is a medicine that does the opposite of what the fight or flight response does. It's sort of it's calming. It reduces the effects of that big adrenaline surge and um, has calming effects as well and can be helpful. In more severe cases, some anti-epileptic medications can stabilize mood and help, particularly when aggression is driven by explosive anger or explosive tantrums or you know, big emotional reactions. Mood stabilizer medications can be helpful and should be considered in those situations if behavioral therapy doesn't help. I mentioned here some anti-seizure medications, which I've had success with in, in people with Angelman syndrome. And then any psychotic medicines, which have a lot of research in the autism world, I've seen them be helpful in individuals with Angelman syndrome, but it should really be used as a last line because they can cause weight gain. They can cause uh, movement side effects. It really should be considered kind of as a last resort for most severe scenarios. And just a moment on when to consider medication. So I think about that. If there's a real major concern of safety at home with family or siblings that can't be managed, um, if no amount of preparation can make it safe to go on a community trip, if people are not eligible for day programs or visiting in-home care staff uh, because of the safety concerns being so severe, um, it not being safe to place any demands at all, and that's just that's never going to be a, a, a recipe for success in the future because all of us need to be able to, to, to tolerate demands and grow and things like that. So these are scenarios where it's really reasonable to think about adding a medicine to an existing treatment plan. So let's come back to John for a moment. So what was helpful for this family? Uh, the family was not able to get ABA in the home. They were not able to get the behavioral therapy of being in school, but they were still able to work with the behavioral therapist who had a, a BCBA designation. I wrote here BCBA. They were still able to work with them to design a behavioral plan. And they designed a behavioral plan around food where they used a timer where John had to wait. It started with just five seconds and then gradually increase that. If John waited five seconds before food, he got his food and a big bit of go, John. And then they sort of extended the length of that wait, and John was making it to 10, 15 minutes and longer. Um, and 
Another thing they did is they hired some in-home staff. They, you know, worked with that staff around their, uh, are they working with other families? Here are the rules in terms of working here around, you know, wearing PPE and washing your hands and being direct with us about symptoms. And having even just that two hours, three days a week helped break a little bit of John's dependency to have the need family with him 100% of the time. And it's helped a little bit with some of the intensity of separation issues, um, having John work some with people besides them. They enriched John's schedule for the most preferred activities. And that really reduced aggression. It also came with a negative, which was that John started to plateau in some of his skills and even had some regression because not as much was being demanded of John. And they were careful to document the areas where John was plateauing in skills or regressing in skills. And um, I documented that in my notes and wrote a letter in support of what we're seeing regression in John's skills in this context to try and advocate for John to return to school in a limited kind of way. Um, documenting a lack of progress in the school is really, can be really impactful in terms of demonstrating that um, kids are not able to make use of the current delivery of education. So that was something that was helpful for John. And a low dose of boost milk helped some too. Okay, so let's move on to our second case. Sam's seven-year-old with Angelman syndrome. At baseline, Sam's got a lot of energy, needs to constantly move all the time, explore, easily distracted at school, um, easily delighted and sort of giddy and excessively silly when with his absolutely preferred uh, peers uh, that can be highly distracting at school. Um, those were some of the Sam challenges Sam had to begin with, but those got supercharged around the COVID-19 crisis. The, there was just less structure during the day for Sam because parents were both working from home best as they could, and hyperactivity seemed to really increase for Sam. Lots of constant silly limit testing behaviors and just taking the house apart with a sort of destructive curiosity because of this lack of structure. And Sam really struggled. The, the online education for Sam, you know, Sam was excited to log on and to see his peers and to see his teachers, but really only got maybe two or three minutes out of that before um, he was distracted by something else or silly rolling around on the floor kind of behavior, making online education not impactful, we'll say. So let's just talk a moment about hyperactivity and Angelman syndrome. Uh, this is something that is so common in Angelman syndrome that they made it sort of part of the behavioral manifestations or clinical features of Angelman syndrome in the consensus guidelines back in 2005. I'll just draw your attention here to, um, you should have seen a circle come up here, or yeah, over hypermotoric behavior um, can, that was just really consistent, almost universally consistent in people with Angelman syndrome. And that trial I told you about from the natural history trial study showed a connection, a correlation between the intensity of hyperactivity and the level of stress on the sort of parent loved one with Angelman syndrome relationship, suggesting that as a symptom, it's very impactful for families. Um, there were two important trials, one that was done in 2000 that showed uh, very prominent levels of hyperactivity as compared to controls, and evidence that it decreased some with age, but for some individuals, while it had decreased, with age, it was still present in adulthood. Um, and then a separate study from 2004 that found higher rates of hyperactivity, again, compared to other individuals with developmental disability. So people who had the same level of developmental delay as people with Angelman syndrome, kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome, did not, on average, have the same level of hyperactivity as people with Angelman syndrome, if that makes sense. So let's talk for a moment about what can be a treatment approach here. Uh, emphasizing adequate sleep and exercise. Easier said than done, obviously. But I, I think about sleep and exercise being a key way to help with attention, how way to help with some excessive hyperactivity. And I use that as uh, sort of the background to try and advocate for more exercise um, and physical activity in the daily schedule for kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome, both at school and then at day programs when they become adults. Um, and I'm surprised how many day programs don't have a lot of physical activity. 
But that's really key for a lot of people with Angelman syndrome who may struggle with hyperactivity and distractibility. And I really try to advocate to that being a part of their routine every way I can. Educational interventions that can be helpful, taking frequent movement breaks, you know, for the most important, you know, therapies that are in school, things like speech or physical therapy, occupational therapy, that those might be times where you want to minimize distractions from other peers and then really maximize inclusion in, you know, the other parts of the educational day. And then, of course, use of praise to keep kids with Angelman syndrome engaged, which can be a really challenging thing to deliver through the computer. And making sure schools are aware of the fact that individuals with Angelman syndrome might overestimate their um, uh, mobility uh, abilities and break into a run, which may be really dangerous. And schools should be aware of that risk um, and provide suitable levels of direct contact to protect from falls. Occupational therapy, I'll just mention this again. So I see a lot of repetitive chewing behaviors, um, repetitive sort of pulling apart, tearing apart kind of behaviors in kids and adults with Angelman syndrome. That's been documented in a lot of trials. And I think about that as being in many ways, perhaps uh, um, in an expression of restlessness or sensory seeking behavior that might be akin to levels of hyperactivity. That's just my sense as a clinician, but um, for a lot of individuals with Angelman syndrome who aren't as mobile, they might have a lot of other expressions of restlessness around repetitive chewing or tearing. And so it's possible that treatments that are helpful for hyperactivity may also be helpful here as well. Uh, okay. Um, so occupational therapists can be thinking about things like chewy tubes, hand fidget, things to address the restlessness, things to provide um, other uh, ways to uh, get out some of that restlessness, and thinking about medicines as well. Um, let's see. It's telling me that I have lost my connection with you all. So let me see if I can try to, if I, if you all are still Chris, able to hear me. Chris, can you hear me? Yeah. Chris, can you yes, hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. Can I you can, hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, I'm just giving everyone the yeah. the, the warning. Um, I'm in Indiana. We have severe weather and tornado warnings and the wind is really bad. So we're going to uh -huh. keep going. But if for some reason we get knocked off, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out plan B, but just, I can hear you and I think everyone else can. So we'll just keep moving until something happens. Perfect. Okay, Amanda, can you still see the presentation on the screen? Yes, I can see the presentation. And why don't you go ahead and just leave your camera off for now? Because that will help with the connection. Okay, sounds good. Uh, all right. Um, let me see. I'll turn the, leave that off. Um, all right, I'm just going to press on. Let's see here. Okay, so let's move on to talking about medications that can be helpful for hypomotoric behavior as well. Guanfacine and clonidine are what are called alpha agonists, which some, they act on what are alpha-2 receptors, and they're similar to propranolol, which I told you about, in so much as they can block some of the uh, effects of stress hormones or adrenaline being released, and they're calming and can be helpful for hyperactivity. Atomoxetine is a medicine that must be swallowed, so it can be challenging in Angelman syndrome, but can be effective for hyperactivity. I've had colleagues that have seen improvement with usage of antidepressant medicines, um, such as Prozac or amitriptyline, that's fluoxetine, Prozac. And then only in the most severe cases, I might think about a medicine like Risperidone, which is an antipsychotic medication, really only in situations where really aggressive or agitated behaviors might also be present. So let's come back to Sam for a moment. So for Sam, what was helpful? So the family uh, worked with the school and found, you know, that Sam had a number of icons which he understood the meaning of, and they used those regularly in school. And so they worked with the school to try and use those to institute a schedule for Sam so that he had structure during his day and expectations of, of, of what was going to happen at any given time. And they really enriched Sam's schedule for outdoor physical activity, especially as the weather got you know, nicer, lots of time in the pool, lots of time outside, lots of time um, moving as much as possible. And that, that just became much more of their day than it normally would be. Um, and then 
again, this is a situation where advocacy with the school system was something that was helpful. So, um, you know, for a lot of school systems, they think about, okay, we need to provide suitable accommodations that address the disability in order to provide education. And writing a letter indicating that Sam couldn't benefit from the education through this online modality really put more pressure on the school to try and think creatively to provide in-person education for Sam, um, whether it was through sort of a skeleton crew at the school with personal protective equipment, or whether that involved bringing um, sort of a, a behavioral team to bear at home. Um, but clearly attesting that they were not meeting Sam's needs and, and putting pressure on the school that way. A low dose of guanfacine was added and that helped some sort of a mild to moderate level in terms of the hyperactivity. And when they were not able to get some of Sam's essential therapies through school, like speech therapy and physical therapy, they sought out those therapies outside clinics in their area um, as much as they could, which had the protective equipment to do it in person, and that helped build Sam's schedule with activity during the day. All right, so let's talk about our last case now, Liz. Um, Liz is a nine-year-old girl with Angelman syndrome. At baseline, family really counted themselves lucky. Liz had excellent sleep. Um, she had some challenges early on that melatonin really seemed to help with at a moderate dosage, three milligrams. But with the onset of the COVID crisis, those problems with sleep came back. Liz, again, was really getting very used to her parents being around all the time and being with them all the time and really loving that and seemed to have now more difficulty separating from their parents when she was going to bed. Taking hours to fall asleep, getting really agitated if parents tried to leave the, the, the room. And when Liz would wake up in the middle of the night and the parent wasn't there, big sort of tantrum or meltdown kind of behaviors until the parents came back um, and they weren't really able to separate at all without some tantrum. Uh, all right, so as we know, sleep problems are really common in individuals with Angelman syndrome. Um, they are at their most prevalent in early childhood and will improve significantly for some. For some, they'll improve but still be present, and for some, they'll continue to be a challenge into adulthood. So one survey that was done found 72% of individuals with Angelman syndrome having difficulty with falling asleep seems to be the most common area of challenge. 66% reported difficulty staying asleep, and 49 reduced total amount of sleep time, like seeming like they have a less need for sleep um, than would be expected for their developmental stage. Why is this such a severe problem in, uh, in Angelman syndrome? Uh, I'm aware of the audience view here. You may be, it, it looks like it, it, it's possible that um, my presentation is halted on my side at the hyperactivity treatment yeah, approach. Your, and, yeah, your, your yeah. slides are gone, it looks like, Chris. But it looks okay. like we my, lost you on the computer, but you're still on the phone. So that's probably okay. what happened. Right. Okay, I see. I'm gonna try and move forward with my presentation here and in terms of the audio piece. Um, and, uh, and then um, hopefully we'll see if it connects over that time. So let me just no talk problem. about, Great, thank you. And thank you all for your flexibility with this. And, and again, speaking of the new normal with COVID. <laughs> um, so uh, why is this such a severe issue in Angelman syndrome? I have, if you were able to see my slide here, what you'd have a demonstration of is sort of three different categories, sort of genetic reasons, medical reasons, and behavioral reasons. So when it comes to genetic reasons, um, the, it's possible that the deletion that results in Angelman syndrome for the majority of people with, uh, with Angelman syndrome uh, also affects uh, parts of the genome that code for the GABA receptor, which is really key in terms of regulation of sleep. Um, when it comes to medical reasons, people with Angelman syndrome have got more challenges with seizures and constipation and sort of um, tremulousness or myoclonus that might wake individuals with Angelman syndrome up more often at night and then make it hard for them to fall back asleep, like incontinence, for instance. And then when it comes to behavioral reasons, I've been talking a lot about how separation, upset and separation, is really, can be really hard for a lot of people with Angelman syndrome. And the biggest separation is separation at bedtime. A lot of individuals with Angelman syndrome have got enough hypermotoric behavior that even just the sitting down for 15 minutes to kind of settle yourself enough for sleep can be really hard uh, as well. So 
those are some of the things that I think probably drive the severity of the, of the issue in, in this condition. My next slide here, just to describe what I have in front of me, I've written here sleep onset associations. And when it comes to sleep onset associations, what that essentially means is that for a lot of individuals with Angelman syndrome and uh, a lot of kids in general, they'll develop things that become highly associated with falling asleep. And that if they're not present, it can all of a sudden now be very difficult to fall asleep. And those situations kind of need to be just so. And those situations are called sleep onset associations. And I have a picture that I put up here of a teddy bear, um, you know, relatively benign sleep onset association, um, some music. I have a radio here. Um, I have my cell phone. You know, I myself struggle with trying to put the cell phone away and not need that in order to fall asleep. And then I have a, a picture of a, a parent and their child. So parents can become the ultimate sleep onset association. And for some individuals of Angelman syndrome, for some families I work with, co-sleeping is just what they figured out that works the best for them. And that is something that allows people to get sleep. And I try not to make parents feel um, shamed for that or that they're doing the wrong thing. But when there's a major when there are major problems with um, sleep onset and waking up in the middle of the night, um, trying to address these sleep onset associations sometimes can be helpful. I just moved on to my next slide here, which I have written as strategies to address sleep onset associations. Um, I've written here kind of a couple of behavioral strategies that are tried to try and help with this issue of separating at bedtime from, uh, from a parent or a caregiver. The first point I have written here is bedtime fading. The idea behind that is that if bedtime is eight o'clock, but an individual with Angelman syndrome, they're not falling asleep till 11, 11 to 30, they're actually doing this seemingly kind of crazy thing of moving their bedtime back to the time that they're actually falling asleep, 11, 11, 30. And the idea behind that is you're using the, the fact that a, person with a kid with or adult with Angelman syndrome is getting sleepy at that time, you're trying to use that to your advantage to help with the separation and to help them get used to the separation because they're, they're, they're really tired at that point. Um, and then once that's working and if it's helpful and it's allowing for a separation, then moving little by little that bedtime a little earlier, you know, by 15 minutes every couple of days, so you get to a more rational bedtime. That's the idea behind bedtime data. I've written here the next uh, point, camping out. That's, you know, the, where the parent moves themselves out of the room little by little. Um, <laughs> involves a lot of sleeping on the floor, not um, oftentimes the most preferred way to go. I have written here next, extinction or modified extinction. This is the idea of really um, either, you know, completely not responding to agitation behavior to bring the parent back in or coming back for just a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes and then separating again. In my experience, that can be really challenging. That's not always successful uh, for kids, teens, and adults with Angelman syndrome. And the last behavioral strategy I wrote here is called the excuse me drill. You all might already be aware of this, but it's, you know, starting the usual routine like you're going to bed um, and co-sleeping, but then saying, oh, excuse me, I need to step out for just a minute and just leaving for a couple, at first just for a couple seconds, you know, just maybe for two seconds or five seconds, and then you come back, big praise, way to go, you did it, you stayed in your bed on your own, I'm so proud of you. And then extending that for a couple more seconds and then minutes and sort of increasing it as you go along. Um, of course, uh, sleep hygiene is important, a consistent bedtime, a quiet, cool sleep environment. Now, if these kind of behavioral strategies are sounding familiar and, and, you're, and you haven't had success with them, you're in good company, these can be really challenging in kids, teens and adults with Angelman syndrome. And if these aren't successful, a lot of the time, the behavioral approach becomes about trying to get an individual with Angelman syndrome used to staying in their room safely using strategies like a veil bed or having the most preferred activities present in their room, you know, having things like a three quarters door where the top of the door opens but the bottom part doesn't. Um, and uh, making sure that the room is completely safe and, you know, that the, the windows are such that you know, people can't you know, break that and, and, and harm themselves by accident. Um, so I started with, you know, when I first worked with kids with, and adults with Angelman syndrome, I had this concern, well, are these behavioral strategies going to help? 
the, the study was, studies would suggest that it does help some individuals. And there was a trial that was done in 2013 um, where parents, it was just five subjects, kids with Angelman syndrome between the ages of two and 11. And uh, parents got once a week guidance from a sleep specialist for six to eight weeks on you know that bedtime fading strategy that I told you about of moving the bedtime back. And what they found is that that really did help with separating at night and it reduced um, agitated behaviors around bedtime. So even in people with Angelman syndrome, again, this study was done in younger kids, there's been signs of improvement. All right, almost done here. I'm just gonna finish up with my last two or three slides and then we'll open it up for questions. And thank you all again for your patience with the technical problems. I'm just gonna mention a couple of sleep medications that I've used and had success with in the past for people with Angelman syndrome. Melatonin, of course, has got the best evidence behind it. It will not work for some individuals with Angelman syndrome, but can show uh, definite improvement. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and then uh, clonidine, I've written here, um, which is can be really effective for falling asleep at night. Uh, trazodone, really effective for maintaining a sleep, you know, through the night for problems with uh, waking up multiple times in the evening. I've written here mirtazapine. This is an antidepressant medication that can really help with falling asleep at night. And then the last thing I've written here is quetiapine, which is Seroquel. Um, this can help significantly with uh, falling asleep. It's an antipsychotic medication, so it really needs to be considered only in the most severe situations, but it can help with some with behavioral agitation at night. So what was helpful for Liz? You know, what this family saw that was improvement is that they tried this pushing back the bedtime, the sort of bedtime fading, um, it turned out to be really hard for them because Liz is not falling asleep till 11.30 midnight, sort of crazy late time. So we started clonidine, which you know Liz took around 8 o'clock, and that moved up a little bit that time where she was sleepy to more like 10.30 or 11, which made the bedtime fading a little bit easier to do. They also changed up the parent who was doing the nighttime routine, so it wasn't the same parent every time so that they're, they reduce some of the intensity of that sleep onset association it has to be this particular parent. Um, they uh, try to maintain a consistent waking up time for Liz with a lot of structure early on in the morning. And they looked into veil beds and a, a careful assessment of the safety of the room when Liz was having challenges with this a little bit later on down the line. So here's my last slide. And what's written here is I've written just three take home points. Um, that for many behavioral challenges have exacerbated during the COVID-19 crisis. That parents and clinicians are called to be creative, but also forceful and effective advocates for their loved ones and patients with Angelman syndrome, and to try to work with schools as much as possible to get the schools being creative as well to try and you know serve uh, this population um, and try to provide safe education. And that medications tend to play just one role in an overall treatment plan. The improvement with medications may be mild to moderate, but I think anyone who has a loved one with Angelman syndrome can see that even mild to moderate changes can really be highly significant. So why don't I stop there to make sure I have some time for questions. Again, I apologize for the technical problem, but I'm gonna make sure a copy of my slides is made available to all attendees. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, sorry about all the technical difficulties. We'll see if we can get through the questions before my power is gone. Um, but I'm hoping everyone is staying safe. I see a lot of messages of people who are in closets right now listening to us. So um, that's dedication. Yeah. So thank you, but still please stay safe. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna ask a, a few questions and we'll see what we can get through. Um, and go from there. So thank you so much, Dr. Chris Carey. Great presentation, so much to digest and so yes. much to take in. Um, we've got a few things here. I'm just gonna start throwing them out. So you talked a little bit about, um, is it Buspar? Um, someone asked if yeah. that medicine pair can pair with Keppra without side effects. Uh, sure, so Keppra is gonna be a really commonly used anti-seizure medication, anti-epileptic medication, and in people with Angelman syndrome. And while I have had some patients with Angelman syndrome maybe have some improvement in behaviors with Keppra, for the majority of people, it will not have necessarily effects on behaviors. And there's a risk with, with Keppra, not a common side effect, of a risk of actually making behaviors worse, making aggressive behaviors or agitated behaviors worse. 
So um, I've never seen that with glucosamine. Glucosamine is going to be less likely to result in behavioral side effects than Keppra. Um, the most common reason I've stopped glucosamine is because it didn't do anything. Okay, there's a lot of questions coming in. Yeah, so um, <laughs> someone asked about um, epidiolex with anxiety yeah. um, as well as seizures and if we've seen that be helpful. Um, my experience has probably been in about five uh, sort of teens and adults with Angelman syndrome who had particularly refractory seizures because it's a hard medication to prescribe unless there's a clear indication from a seizure standpoint, because it's really expensive still. So in all the patients I saw taking it, um, they were still having significant seizures. And in those patients, I would say I've not yet seen reductions in terms of aggressive behaviors or agitation with epidiolex. However, I have had some families who reported that they were giving uh, CBD oil and saying that they saw some improvement. Um, and then I've had some families that say they tried getting CBD oil with a small amount of THC in it um, that have said that they've seen improvement too. Um, okay. Someone really needs to study this. We'd like to, you know, study it comprehensively. But so far, I've not seen substantial improvement with epidiolex, but it could have just been the luck of the draw so far. Sure. Okay. So um, someone asked a question about the quarantine. So could um, depression be a consequence of this quarantine? Uh, this person has been secluded since March, and the daughter um, is and the daughter is more and more sensitive and prone to cry without a visible reason. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. In the in the first case I mentioned regarding John, um, that was on the parents' forefront of their mind as well because when John was wanting to go to school in the morning, you know, getting his things he would get in order to go to school, and parents would say no school, John would cry and get really upset. And so I do think that there, the, this takes an emotional toll on um, uh, individuals with Angelman syndrome who may really develop strong connections with teachers or staff at day programs. Um, I think about um, trying to maintain a connection with preferred people who may work at the school or may work at a day program through things like whether it's a Zoom visit or uh, if they would allow a visit with protective equipment being present. Um, because oftentimes it's, I think, missing that person. Or that's always been the situation I thought. Um, I also see something that looks like depression, but it's not depression, which is doing less activities and being willing to do less leisure skills and only wanting to do the most preferred things. Um, and I think about that as being more of a form of regression in some way rather than necessarily depression. Um, and one thing that can help you distinguish between that is for a person with depression, they will lose their interest even in their most preferred things, even the things that they love to do, whether it's pool time or, you know, um, having a smile on their face when they spend time with their preferred, you know, with a parent or a caregiver. If you're really seeing signs of losing interest in those things, then depression should be on your forefront thinking about. So um, this question said, um, is talking about her daughter is getting ABA therapy for aggressive behavior, but the moment she gets off the behavior intervention plan, she goes back to the aggressive behavior. Not if there is um, other things I could do to help besides, it. she wants to know if there's other things she could do outside of ABA therapy, or is it expecting too much from, for the aggressive behavior to completely go away? Uh, let's see. I question. think it really, you yeah, know, it's a really good one. It's a really good one too because this, the big drop off, right, is well, in the state of Massachusetts, it's 22 years. It's just, it, in my experience, a lot harder to get ABA advocated for for an adult than kids. And which seems crazy to me because for adults, you need it all the more because aggression is all the more significant in an adult as compared to a kid. So I'm a big believer in trying to advocate for ABA therapy into adulthood. Um, I think the answer to the question here depends a little bit upon what might be driving that behavior. Um, you know, if it's driven by sort of, sort of attention, if it's driven by agitation, if it's driven by severe agitation or kind of tantrum behaviors, then it's possible that adding a medication to a behavioral plan may be helpful. Um, it may also be that um, that regression that comes with removing the behavioral plan needs to be documented and communicated to the school or the day program. 
to attest for the ongoing essential nature of that behavioral therapy um, so that uh, it's not pulled away. Um, sometimes, you know, behavioral therapy will result in improvement, even times for months, and then people will say, okay, now we can take it away. Well, um, sometimes you really need to advocate for continuing it even when things are good. So we have multiple questions around solutions around screeching and hollering when frustrated. Any tips on that? Uh, yeah, so this is another thing where um, a uh, it's possible that a behavioral strategy could come around for that as well. But, you know, I think about, when I think about agitation with um, a limit set or with a, like taking away a preferred activity, um, you know, aggression can be, the that's the behavior that I talked about, aggression, but there are so many different sort of behavioral expressions of frustration that could also be a part of that. Self-injury could be a part of that. Um, disrobing can be a part of that. If an individual with Angelman syndrome is capable of this running away, um, you know, there are a lot of different ways of expressing that sort of frustration and loud vocalization can certainly be a one of, uh, part of that. So um, while a calming medication may help with that as well, um, a behavioral strategy might involve trying to extinguish that and see if it's driven by attention. Um, mm. And if attention pains that and drives it, then it may be something that, you know, a judicious, you know, uh, ignoring might help reduce. You know, that's another example of a situation where if you ignore it, it might get more intense but it might only get more intense for a shorter period until it, it resolves. I think that's a situation where working with a behavioral therapist to think about whether that's a good idea. That might be a strategy that they might recommend for it. Absolutely. But I really believe, in, just one other thought on that, because easier said than done than what I just said, I really believe that working with a behavioral therapist is key here for this because it's never so simple as me saying, try this and I'll see you in three months. Right, You, you right. oftentimes you work with someone on a weekly basis because it doesn't always go well the first time and you need to modify the plan to the individual. Absolutely. And um, I did get a message from um, someone who works with us as a re resource director around um, IEPs. And she just wanted to make sure to point out for the last question that a behavior plan um, needs to be changed or re-examined, but it shouldn't just be removed. So for that person who asked that question, that um, if, if you're dealing with it to where someone's actually just removing your behavior plan, um, that, that that shouldn't be, that that should be something that is re-examined or changed. So if you have more questions about that, uh, reach out to us and we can get you in contact with our IEP specialist and they can help you with that as well. So um, a couple, a couple more that. questions if you have time. Well, um, fine with me. Okay, let's see. So someone asked about, um, do you have a recommendation for as needed medications for anxiety? Their daughter doesn't have anxiety all the time, but we would like mm -hmm. something to use in specific situations when they're, she's very anxious and didn't know yes. if that's something that is common. Yeah, in fact, it's, um, yeah, I appreciate that question. And I think I might modify this presentation in the future to include that because it's such a nice question. Um, that can be a really nice strategy, um, short of starting a medicine on a daily basis, you know, which I think a lot of families understandably want to hold off on. Um, so just an as needed medication for situations like a dental appointment or a visit to a crowded environment, um, which usually, which might lead to dysregulated behavior is a really nice idea. The two medicines that I use the most for this are um, the medication, a medication called Ativan or Lorazepam, this is a, a benzodiazepine medication. These medicines act on GABA to, they're acutely calming, they're, they're treatments for panic attacks. So other examples of them are, you know, lorazepam, diazepam, which is Valium. So those class of medicines. And then a medicine called clonidine, which I mentioned as an effective sleep medicine, but at a lower dosage, it also can be acutely calming. Um, these medicines tend to take, you know, depending on the medicine, anywhere from 20 minutes 30 minutes to be effective. So, you know, it's best used in some anticipatory way, but um, they can absolutely be effective and um, they've been helpful for a couple of adults I've worked with uh, with Angelman syndrome. Perfect. So I, I want to ask this question because I think it's something that comes out a lot um, for us. And this question is about 
Um, their daughter gags a lot when she goes to the hospital or places that smell like a hospital. She's asking, do you think that's related to anxiety and what can we do to help every time, basically every time that they have to go get an EEG or do an overnight, it's, it's you know, the EEG alone is stressful, right? But then they're adding some gagging and throwing up on top of that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I have, um, I have one uh, a kid that comes to mind in this case of uh, uh, a young uh, patient with Angelman syndrome. I was working with sort of a pre-pubertal um, a patient who had improvement in that symptom with Buspirum. Um, and then I have another patient who didn't improve with Buspirum. So I certainly can't promise that it's a cure for what ails you around this issue um, in all cases. I have had one child who had improvement in that sort of very issue. What happens is he would, um, he would come down and the smell of breakfast in the morning would result in repetitive gagging. Or at least we thought that was the precipitant. It seemed like the most common connected precipitant. Um, it's, you know, in terms of whether that's anxiety, it's hard to know for sure. You know, when I talk about the fight or flight response, um, you know, uh, part of the fight or flight or anxiety response is a slowing down of digestion. And so you can imagine that uh, if that's resulting in nausea and now you're smelling something that's nauseating or a strong smell, um, that that might then result in, in vomiting or repetitive gagging uh, jag. Um, it's also just important to think about as well when you hear about repetitive gagging to make sure you're not missing gastroesophageal reflux, um, mm -hmm. you know, heartburn. Um, so that can pursue, produce excessive saliva um, and sort of a discomfort in the throat, which can result in gagging. And then now you're stuck in a, a gagging sort of jag. So making sure you're not missing reflux is important for that case as well. So maybe one more question. Um... There's a couple more, but we'll, we'll hopefully maybe be able to answer those at another time. Um, how uh, how mm -hmm. risky is, uh, I'm going to totally butcher this. Um, how risky is uh, Risperdel? Oh, Ris Risperdel? My angel is on it since, yeah. yes, since 2013. Uh, so, yeah, there's a question now specifically about Risperdel. The other name for Risperdel is Risperidone. They, I think they did that to confuse us uh, specifically. Um, so this is a medicine that's a mood stabilizer. It's an antipsychotic medicine, but it's not used for psychosis in people with Angelman syndrome or in autism where it's used more often. It's used for highly severe aggression um, or highly severe self-injury, where, where when you think of what the precipitant for that aggression is, I'm thinking about emotional regulation problem, intense tantrums or agitated emotional response. In Risperdal, I've certainly seen situations where it's been helpful. Um, the challenge with it is that it certainly increases appetite for the majority of people, and overweight can already be a challenge for a lot of people with Angelman syndrome. And at lower dosages than for other people, you can see um, effects on motor abilities. So that might be sort of um, uh, what I've seen is kind of almost looking like Parkinson's disease, slowed down movement. It's not a permanent side effect. Um, it's a dose-dependent effect. Um, but I've seen it more in people with Angelman syndrome than I have in people with other developmental disabilities. So I think that medicine needs to be used in caution, with caution, but in highly severe situations, um, it can be the difference between being able to attend a day program. Um, mm. So I think you need to think about making sure the medicine you're choosing, if you're choosing a medicine, is commensurate to the severity of the situation. And um, I'm glad that there are, you know, medicines that can be this effective for really severe situations, but you want to be careful about choosing it. Um, let's see, I think those are probably the most important side effects to talk about with, uh, with that medication. Well, and we have, uh, we had a, quite a few questions that came through as if someone wanted to have um, some time with you personally, what that looks like. And just yeah. to kind of, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Angelman Syndrome um, Foundation Clinics and the 15Q Clinic Network, um, that is your best way to get, you know, to have a consultation with someone like that, Dr. Chris Geary. Mo many of our clinics have a behavior specialist as part of their clinic visit. If you want to have some conversations and um, sit down and work through some of the specific issues regarding your individual with Angelman syndrome. Um, I would also, uh, Dr. Chris Geary, can you give advice for individuals who can't get to a clinic? You know, we do really hard at the foundation to work to try to um, have a clinic within driving distance or get people access to really good care. 
but some people just can't get to a clinic. If they are having some of these issues with their individuals with Angelman syndrome, what would you consider? What would you give advice of being the first step that they need to do? Uh, let's see. So, I mean, we're really committed to trying to release um, sort of guidance documents mm -hmm. on yes. a treatment approach to for behavioral concerns in Angelman syndrome. We're working with a number of specialists in the field to try and publish uh, articles, which then can be used by a local neurologist who maybe a uh, a world expert in management of seizures but may know less about management of tough behaviors that could look at those documents and and uh, and try to do some of the same things that you would do if you made your way to, to Boston or um, you know a lot of the other uh, ex, uh, expert Angelman syndrome clinics around the US um, I uh, will have situations sometimes where I do a one-time evaluation and if someone is coming from a far distance and I might work with their local provider around ideas of what to try next. Um, and I've uh, done curbsides, I use that term curbside, what I mean is like a, a brief conversation over the phone with the local clinicians who are asking for advice. So, you know, I'm thinking about medicine or I'm thinking about a, a potential treatment plan for the patient I'm working with with Angelman syndrome. Can I just pick your brain and talk with you for a moment? Um, so both, uh, these are potential options uh, as well. And I try to have good communication between the other clinicians that are working at the other Angelman syndrome clinics um, to try and have some consistency in what we're doing so that you get similar treatment recommendations if you go to um, Vanderbilt and if you go to Chicago than if you go to, to Boston. Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up the issue of standards of care. And sorry, I have a child right next to me. <laughs> say say hi, right. Maiden. Everyone's watching you. Because <laughs> um, I think it's really, really important like to have that that access to be able to take those cares to, to patients. I think also the, a question came up about telehealth. So if you are interested in, um, the question was more around, you know, airlines not a lot, making people wear masks and our individuals can't wear a mask. So it's harder to get to some of these clinics. Uh, some of our yeah. clinics are offering telehealth. I think um, as far as a first patient visit, how would that work for you? If you haven't seen someone before, can you do a first visit with telehealth? Normally I can't, but in the COVID-19 crisis in terms of it's brought up some possibilities of me seeing people um, for a first visit through telehealth. Um, I don't know how long that will necessarily last for it. Really, it hinges upon these rules around uh, insurance, particularly, but um, I've uh, I've done that a couple times in the COVID nineteen crisis. So, um, so yeah, so I think the important things uh, is that if you have questions about wanting to connect with any of these clinicians or with any of the the um, the um, AS clinics, um, please make sure you reach out to the foundation. We can help um, get mm -hmm. you in contact with our new, our brand new fifteen Q clinic coordinator that can answer those questions and help you get the get the support that you need. So just to be respectful mm -hmm. of everyone's time, I think uh, there are a few more questions, but maybe we can get um, Dr. Carey to answer those and we can get those yeah. out with this recording. <laughs> and we will also yeah. make sure to get the slides for you guys as well. Someone asked if we could yeah. get this recording out sooner than later. <laughs> sooner than later and we will do our best to get that out in the next couple of days and still waiting until the end of the day get it in a minute um and so, i'm sorry guys um and so we'll make sure to get that out as soon as possible and like i said sorry about the technical difficulties tonight but thank you so yeah. much dr kiri your words have been so helpful tonight and so wonderful uh, we're so Thank thankful you. to have you in the Angelman space in working with our kids because I think uh, and all, all of our individuals with Angelman syndrome, we're just blessed to have you. So thank you so much for being here tonight. And for that those, so kind of you. yeah, and for those of you, um, just a reminder, this is not over. Tomorrow we're going to take a break. So we'll, you'll get a night off, but starting on Wednesday, we will have everything insurance. So Eric Wright will be here to answer any questions and go through all of the insurance, Medicaid, all those questions that you may have. So you don't wanna miss that. And then on Thursday, we will have um, a session around adult transition and, and the different living situations. Um, and then the last, we will end with um, Dr. Lynn Bird, who will talk and work through a, a new tool that she's created to help with the IEP process. So we hope you'll continue to join us in the next couple of days as we wrap up our um, awesome um, ASF Virtual Palooza.
for now. For those of you that are in any area of this storm tonight, please be safe and be careful. And once again, thank you, Dr. Carey, for being with us tonight, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.